When you think about preventing heart disease, you probably think about cutting back on butter, red meat, and saturated fat. But I want to share with you an old study that I think is actually pertinent still today, looking at coronary artery occlusion and stenosis, that is the narrowing of the arteries, and making correlations with common biomarkers, particularly non-fasted glucose levels and elevated levels of hemoglobin A1c, which as you know, it's a marker reflecting long-term glucose balance or homeostasis in the body. When your average glucose level starts to rise because you're having a lot of hyperpalatable processed foods and not really exercising, your hemoglobin A1c will increase. It's a marker of glycosylation or glucose binding onto different proteins in the body. In the case of the hemoglobin A1c, this is binding onto your hemoglobin. But the study that we're going to talk about today that involved over 250 patients out of Italy is titled Glucose Metabolism and Coronary Heart Disease in Patients with Normal Glucose Tolerance. What's important about the inclusion criteria of this study is individuals who had diabetes or a diagnosis of heart disease were excluded. So these were relatively healthy people that were enrolled over the course of a six month period to get a coronary artery angiogram. And what they wanted to do is look at different common biomarkers to see what sort of correlation there was with elevated levels of these biomarkers with the degree of coronary artery stenosis or occlusion as a reflection of the process known as atherosclerosis, which is the placking of the coronary arteries. And they looked at all sorts of different coronary arteries. We're gonna talk about table three right here. This is the correlation of the number of stenosed vessels as dependent variables. And the variables are non-fasted glucose, hemoglobin A1C, the HOMA IR score, post-mill insulin, fasting insulin, triglycerides, total cholesterol, LDL, the common biomarkers, including blood pressure. And what you might find particularly interesting is the biomarker that was most strongly correlated with degree of coronary artery stenosis or occlusion, that is placking, was post-meal glucose. Secondarily was hemoglobin A1c and then post-meal insulin and fasting insulin. You also see triglycerides. And what was interesting is LDL cholesterol ranked down towards age. Like age was statistically significant there, but it wasn't as significant in contrast to the non-fasted glucose and the HOMA IR score and hemoglobin A1C. So we all hear how increasing age is an independent risk factor for developing cardiovascular disease, but it turns out that poor metabolic health may be the strongest independent risk factor that is strongly correlated with degree of coronary artery stenosis or occlusion of the vessels of the heart. And so we're going to focus a little bit more on the details of this just to, again, I don't think we can talk about this enough. I know many of you are convinced you understand that metabolic health is impossible to separate from cardiovascular disease, but the average person thinks that in order to improve the health of their heart, they need to go on a plant-based diet. They need to become vegetarian. It doesn't matter how much sugar they have so long as they're consuming plants and high, a high fiber diet. Red meat is really bad, they might think but soda is okay or Wheaties are okay because they're derived from plants. But what we see with these studies is poor metabolic health is the strongest independent variable that is tightly correlated with the degree of coronary artery occlusion or stenosis, which precedes myocardial infarctions and heart attacks and, and all these challenging events. So before we dive further into the details, I just want to appreciate you being here. Thanks for hitting that like button. Thank you for subscribing. I appreciate your comments. It really helps the algorithm. Now, since we're talking about metabolic health, I just want to remind you about berberine. Berberine is a very effective natural product to help support metabolic health. It's been used in Ayurvedic medicine as well as traditional Chinese medicine for 3,000 years. It helps to kickstart your fast. It gets you into a fasting state by increasing ketones and helping with glucose homeostasis in the body. And as a side benefit, it also can help with cravings. So if you're like me, and sometimes after dinner, you might want to reach for some cookies or some ice cream or snacks or things like that, that you know having those foods close to bedtime will derail your, your metabolic health. You might want to benefit from trying the Berberine Fasting Accelerator, two to three capsules around mealtime in the evening. And if you really want to support your metabolic health in the morning as well to help kickstart your fast and to help prevent snacking, it can go a long way. So check out the many reviews over at myoscience.com and save with the code podcast at checkout, and I'll put links in the description below. But getting back to the study that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association 20 years ago. Now, it's sad that we don't hear much about this. We keep hearing 
the story about cholesterol, although we now know that LDL cholesterol has this J-shaped association and has poor prognostic value for indicating future risk of cardiovascular events. But we have this data showing that patients with metabolic syndrome and impaired fasting glucose tolerance and high post-meal glucose and post-meal insulin levels tend to have more aggressive stenosis and placking of their arteries. So why aren't we hearing more about this? Well, it turns out that of the 234 patients that were followed for six months here out of Italy, uh, they were divided into four groups based upon their coronary artery angiogram. So uh, group zero had no significant stenosis in their coronary arteries. Group one had vessel disease. Group two had more pronounced vessel disease. And group three had pretty severe vessel disease. And there were simple correlation analysis showed that the factors correlated with the extent of atherosclerosis were levels of post meal glucose. This was the independent factor that was most tightly tethered to the degree of coronary artery stenosis or placking. The second variable, the second biomarker, I shall say, that showed the tightest correlation with the degree of coronary artery stenosis was hemoglobin A1C. The third independent biomarker that was tightly tethered with the degree of coronary artery stenosis was post-meal insulin, followed by fasting insulin and HOMA IR score. Now, of course, LDL cholesterol, total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol were also independently correlated with degree of stenosis, but not to the same extent as post-meal glucose, hemoglobin A1C, and post-meal insulin and fasting insulin. So why aren't we focusing on this? How many times has your doctor said, Hey, Sally, we haven't had your physical in a while. We know that your father died of heart disease. We know your uncle has heart disease. Why don't you go have a high glucose containing meal and look at your labs and see what your post meal glucose and insulin levels are? This is almost never done unless you have uh, really high fasting glucose levels above 125 milligrams per deciliter, suggesting that you are on the path of having diabetes. Then they might do or recommend a post meal challenge. But the post, the oral glucose tolerance test, we can do this without having to consume a bunch of sugar. You can just have a higher carb meal about an hour before you draw your labs and look at your non-fasted insulin, non-fasted glucose, and non-fasted triglycerides. It turns out that looking at your blood work in the non-fasted window gives us a better insight into your overall metabolic health, as we've talked about many times on this podcast. Heart disease, cancer, diabetes, uh, all these uh, obesities, these diseases do not occur because you're in a fasted state. This occurs because in the post-meal window, there's oxidative stress, there's glycolytic stress, there's fructosylation. We know that glucose can be converted to fructose. Fructose has a high ability to bind to your bodily proteins. It's called fructosylation. It can bind to albumin. It can bind to your nerves. It can bind to the retinal cells in your eye. So we need to start to look at and, and look at, focus on non-fasted labs. And so what I recommend, and we talk about this in the Bloodwork Masterclass, is get a baseline of your fasting labs, you know, your common CBC, your Chem24 CBC with differential, again, over at highintensityhealth.com, we have the free blood work cheat sheet. All of this is on page one. We also recommend looking at hormones as well, such as DHA, sulfate, testosterone, estrogen, and, and beyond. But looking at your liver enzymes, looking at your fasted glucose, fasted insulin, fasted triglycerides, so you have a nice baseline. Then the next time you retest, it could be 90 days later, it can be six months later. If you're relatively young and healthy, it's just annually. Since you have your baseline levels, you want to look at your non-fasted levels. So you would have a meal that you would habitually eat. Maybe it's your lunch, which is some sweet potatoes and some uh, maybe some grass-fed beef, for example, with an avocado. Whatever your go-to meal is that you like to habitually eat, you want to test your labs about an hour to 90 minutes in the post-meal window to see what your glucose levels are, to see what your insulin levels are. And I think, and I'm a little biased here, but your triglycerides, non-fasted triglycerides, give us a beautiful insight into your metabolic health. So we should be looking at this because we have data showing that high post-meal glucose and high post-meal insulin is independently correlated with the degree of coronary artery atherosclerosis. And I want to just share with you, again, a few concluding remarks from this study. The investigators say this evidence raises two questions. First, of the glycemic variables, which are the best indicators of cardiovascular risk in patients with normal glucose tolerance? Again, these are not diabetic patients. These are average people just like you or I. And again, what they found is high post-meal glucose, hemoglobin A1C, and high post-meal insulin are strongly tethered with the degree of coronary artery atherosclerosis. And I think this is really important because many of you 
do have high LDL cholesterol, but you also have high HDL cholesterol and low triglycerides and low levels of glucose because you've run your continuous glucose monitors, you've checked your spot glucose after meals and fasting, and you know that your metabolic health is relatively good. So in that context, should we, we be very concerned about your particularly high LDL, even though, again, your triglycerides are low and HDL is high. I think that's important. The investigators say, and secondly, do their values correlate with the severity of coronary heart disease? The results from the Rancho Bernardo study show that the level of glycosylated hemoglobin is a better predictor of coronary heart disease and ischemic heart disease mortality than is fasting or post-load glycemia, while the results of the HORN study indicate that post-meal glycemia and to a lesser extent hemoglobin A1C levels are associated with increased cardiovascular mortality. Moreover, some data are inconsistent with a linear association and others with a threshold effect. And essentially these investigators are trying to validate their methods and make the case for doing the study in this way because they're up to this point, there was mixed results. But again, the 253 individuals that were part of the study helped provide pretty good evidence that not high non-fasted insulin along with hemoglobin A1C are linked with more severe vessel disease. And so what they found is uh, of the 234 patients that were part of the study, uh, 42 of them had no vessel disease 72 had moderate vessel disease, uh, 64 had pretty severe vessel disease, and 56 had really bad vessel disease. Um, so it turns out that you know having moderate coronary artery occlusion is actually kind of, if you look at the bell curve, most of the individuals is, uh, that enrolled in the study had some degree of coronary artery atherosclerosis. And again, the statistical association was pretty solid for having high post meal glucose levels and high hemoglobin A1C. Um, although there was a, you know, the correlation coefficient for the uh, high LDL levels and uh, low HDL, there were associations there. So again, it's not to say that high LDL cholesterol does not indicate any risk for coronary artery uh, atherosclerosis or stenosis, but that high non-facet glucose is more tightly tethered to having higher levels of, atheros of, of coronary artery occlusion. So I think that's basically the take home is that we should be prioritizing and focusing on metabolic syndrome futures and looking at insulin resistance scores and non-fasted uh, glucose levels. And so again, what I recommend, getting your baseline labs in a fasted state and then having a habitual meal that you normally eat and then seeing what happens in the post-meal window. And this is not uncommon. You see this all the time when people go in and do a cardiac stress test. They're not doing this while they're sitting. You're stressing the system to see what happens after the fact. This is what we do when we do a VO2 max test, which I recommend doing annually on your birthday or near your birthday to know if your fitness is progressing or regressing a really great score. So you're stressing the system. Eating stresses homeostasis. You're causing glucose to rise. You're causing insulin to rise. You're causing free fatty acids and triglycerides to rise. So you want to see what is happening to your body when you stress the system, if you will. So I think that's important. So again, table three, table four, really tell the story here that the correlation coefficient, the, the, the degree of how tightly tethered one biomarker is with the degree of coronary artery stenosis or occlusion um, really points to po high non-facet glucose levels. So the more insulin resistant you are and the higher that your uh, post-meal insulin load is, that is more tightly tethered uh, to the degree of uh, issues with regards to coronary arteries. And you know LDL is the second to the last biomarker here on these independent uh, futures of coronary artery occlusion, but yet that still, for some reason, is the biomarker that many doctors seemingly monomaniacally focus on. Like, how many doctors will say, oh my gosh, Sally, your hemoglobin A1C7, you are at higher risk for heart disease. You often don't really hear much about that. You hear about the risk of diabetes, but heart disease claims way more lives than diabetes, and it's independently associated with, uh, as we now know, uh, aberrant metabolic health. So I would love to know what your thoughts are, my friends. Let me know in the comment section below. Hopefully you found this information helpful. I will link this study in the description, in the show notes, and we will catch you on a future episode down the road. Until then, have a good one.